Sometimes it's not the most talented people who get what they want. It's always the people who work for it. And it's always the people who go after it. But if you go after your dreams and you try for things, you have a chance at getting them. Mindy, it is great to have you here for the Sessions interviews. Thank you so, so much. We had a great time with the panel that we just had here in Illinois. You mm -hmm. spoke well, you had great advice to share, and what's amazing about it is you are the sought after fantastic saxophonist that is out there. Thank you. Grammy nominee, you have really kind of pushed the business to a wonderful degree, showing that it can happen from a female playing saxophone at the highest level and singing. It's incredible that you put this all together at such a great, intense pace. <laughs> It really has been. I'm tired. I'm yeah. tired listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how it began. Where did saxophone first, or just music, enter your life? You know what? Uh, music was always around me, and it was my normal. And mm. I was really lucky to grow up like that. I was born, and they whisked me off. My dad toured with a band called The Entertainers, and I spent the first five years of my life on the road with a band. <laughs> Your dad played what? He played saxophone and B3 organ. Really? You know, it was this high-energy soul band. I mean, it was fun. I'd watch my dad play sax, and I mean, he was shimmying and shaking, <laughs> and his knees were knocking. He was that guy. And he just made it look fun. So, you know, when we did settle down and the band broke up, I moved to St. Petersburg, Florida, and they had school band. I was very lucky to have school band. Mm. And our teacher, Ann Reynolds, just said, I just put all the instruments out on the ground, go look around, see what moves you, pick one, sit down, and we'll learn how to play it. And <laughs> I, I just thought, I want to have as much fun as my dad seems to be having. It, it just seemed like he was having a blast. I want to <laughs> have that much fun. So I picked saxophone. And, you know, I just had so much fun playing it. I've taken it way too far now. <laughs> uh, but it inspires me. And I, I found myself playing it. And I, I found something that, that was, you know, it felt special for me. So uh, it, it's been something that's always been a part of my life. So that music program in school was very, very helpful for you to kind of yeah. frame your, your musical direction. Yeah, I always fight for bringing arts back to mm. the schools. I just think it's... It's something that is going to affect our society. I mean, it's yeah. not just music. I mean, we get music everywhere. But to sit in a classroom and learn to play an instrument, learn that language, mm -hmm. learn to emote, learn to play with other people, the teamwork, the integrity of learning things, the discipline of having to learn an instrument and, and really immerse in something and become great at something. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think all those things you don't learn in math class or reading class, you learn them in band. And I, I just think it's something that we're losing as a society, taking the arts out of schools, and, and it's going to come back to haunt us, not just in people creating great music, but, but more than that. Absolutely, and it gave us purpose that we were in the school music program because we, we, we found music as a way of keeping us off the streets, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's that, definitely. I was definitely kept off the street. I would do <laughs> anything, you know, that they would let me in grade school and middle school and high school. I was in every chorus and, you know, marching band. I was the drum major. Of course, I had to lead it, you know. I knew early on I would be a band leader. But I, I just, I loved it, and I just wanted you know, music around me. My grandmother was an opera singer, mm. so she would come over to the house, you know, be playing piano and singing arias. And my father started putting together rock bands, so I'd be sitting in their practice rooms watching. You know, it was, it was very normal just to have crazy music around. I'd walk into our house, you know, after school, and my father had a recording studio set up in the third bedroom. So literally, I'd walk in, and there'd be a drum kit in the living room and there'd be all these cables into the bedroom and you know someone was singing into my closet and I just all right cool <laughs> you know so it was it was a cool way to grow up and you know some people's dads are firefighters and they think oh, I think I'll be a firefighter it just it seemed to be the thing to do. <laughs> well, that's about as organic as it can be yeah. to be exposed with it to that degree. Were you taking lessons at all now, saxophone lessons? You know, as a kid, I didn't take lessons. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that, you know, my father and my grandmother being musicians, that they didn't push that. Yeah. Um, and they wouldn't teach me. They really both thought 
if music is something you love, you're going to find it. Mm. And they didn't want to be that person that pushed me or prodded me or, you know, hit me over the head with a ruler like, you better do this. <laughs> and I applaud them for that, actually. I, I think that some people's parents, you know, really push them into something that maybe it's not what they love. Mm. But they definitely said, if, you know, if you're going to play, you better practice. Yeah. And, you, you know, and they, they gave me good advice along the way, but I probably took less than a handful of private lessons before I hit college. Very much self-taught and, and just getting it from school band and kind of watching people on MTV and uh, listening to records at home and playing along. And who were you listening to at that time? You know what, I was a total kid who listened to the radio. I wasn't the intellectual jazz type who was listening to Coltrane and Miles Davis. I went to school with some people in college that, you know, they listened to all this jazz growing up and they, they were so educated going into <laughs> college. And I just thought, wow, I don't even know who Charlie Parker is. I had never heard of Miles Davis. <laughs> you know, I was watching Tina Turner and Hart and Bruce Springsteen and just, you know, I wished I could sing like Tina Turner and I couldn't, but I could play sax like she sang, you know? I could have that power and that grit, you know, or I watched the girls from Hart and and Nancy Wilson and, you know. Wonderful girls. Oh my gosh, I, I met saw. met them both several times, they're sweet people, sweet people. I got to meet them once, we opened for them uh, a couple of years ago now and they were just great. I had to be a geek and just tell them, <laughs> Nancy, I watched you kick up your leg, you know, mid guitar solo yeah. and just, you know, you were a girl who had just all this immense power and yeah. confidence. Yeah. And I wasn't looking at it at that point as women or men. I wasn't looking at who are my female role models. That right. just did not enter my mind. But looking back as an adult, they were huge role models. I was looking at people like that. I loved that Springsteen was just out and in your face and yeah. Clarence Clemens was this bigger than life force by his side playing yeah. sax and the sax was, it just filled the room, yeah. you know? So I took my early cues from a lot of rock and roll and, and soul and R&B. Fantastic. So now you start putting the band together. Yeah. Mindy Bear and the Bone Shakers. Okay. How did that whole start? I went to college knowing that I wanted to play and I wanted to sing and I wanted to write my own music and have my own band. But I never knew what that would look like exactly. Mm. It's not like I had this, this perfect vision of this is it. I know exactly what it is. I just wanted to play. Uh, but I had a really cool saxophone teacher at Berklee College of Music, Joe Viola. Every day I walked into Joe's office, he would say, did you start your own band yet? you need to start your own band. And this guy was like a Yoda of the saxophone. I mean, this tall and, you know, kind of walked like this. <laughs> Every time I walked in his office, start your own band. Please start your own band. You have something different. Don't be David Sanborn. There's already a David Sanborn. Don't be John Coltrane. There's already a John Coltrane. Don't be anyone else. Be yourself. Take what you've learned and take people that you've listened to and your influences and create your own. Mm. That's your path to success. Nice. I did start my own band in college and he was nice enough to let me do my senior recital in college as a performance, as a concert. Nice. And that just wasn't done usually. It was yeah. usually, you know, play this sonata or play yeah. this jazz solo from, you know, Cannonball Adderley right. or someone else. So he really set me on a path of making my own and I thank him for that. What a great, great start to a career to just, okay, I'm gonna start being myself and figuring out what that looks like and figuring out what that sounds like yeah. and figuring out people I can do it with. It's all pretty intense at that age. Absolutely, but great to have that kind of a mentor and that kind of advice yeah. and that kind of a direction where he obviously saw something. Yeah. Where did the songwriting part come from? How, how, how do you write songs? How, how do you go through that entire process? Who knows how you write songs? I know I have things come to me and, and I write them down or I sing them into my phone at this point. Yeah. But I always heard melodies and sometimes I'd hear words with the melodies and I, it was like a radio in my head. <laughs> and if I'd stop to, to write them down, it was cool. If I didn't stop, I'd write them down another time <laughs> or another song would come. I always loved the songwriting process. And it started when I was in college. I mean, I used to make up songs and everything in normal school, but in college I kind of learned 
what it was and learned a little structure to it. Mm. And it, it was fun to just kind of emote and see what would come out. And still, you know, I, I look back at the records that I've made, each one of them, they're each kind of a snapshot of where I was at a certain point. Right. And the songwriting, it, it shows me where I was and what I was thinking yeah. and how I was living and what I was thinking about. And I love that you can hopefully take something that's in your mind or take where your heart is at a certain point and put it on tape. And you can have that as, wow, it's a, it's a scrapbook of my life and what I was thinking and you know, what was going on at the time. So I, I love songwriting in that aspect, that it can be a fluid part of your life and be that catharsis of thought. Which is really what it is when you think about it. That's really that cathartic expression of what you're doing. Yeah. We talked about on the panel about, about the business side of things, about we have to really kind of be focused on what yeah. business is and how to run this business and how to brand yeah. what we do. You do this so well. Just talk a little bit about that, about how you do that. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I don't know that I ever thought about being a brand early on. I, I was a kid just thinking, I just want to play. And I, I love singing and I, I love making music and that's you know, what I wanted to do. But as I learned the business and I didn't have rich parents, I obviously had musicians <laughs> as, <laughs> as parents, you know, <laughs> I had to go out there and find my way. And I moved to Los Angeles, woo, that was not easy. I mean, there are a million sax players out there who could play circles around me who were already immersed in the circuit and, you know, they had their gigs, they were rocking. I learned that what made me different and what kind of excluded me and made me an outsider at first in my mind right. became something that was my ally. I never thought about being a woman in a man's world, which I am, but it never crossed my mind early on. It became something that is my brand. Yeah. I am a woman in a man's world. Yeah. And coming from a different musical background, a lot of saxophone players come from jazz. I came from rock yeah. and soul, and I found jazz. Trust me, I learned who Miles Davis and, <laughs> and Cannonball Adderley and Wayne Shorter and, you know, Good. all those guys in college, and I immersed. But what was my core and what I grew up with really became part of my brand. It took me a while to figure that out, you know. You have to kind of go on that journey of who am I and how do I fit into this yeah. huge music business I was playing for the Backstreet Boys, and then Tina Marie, and then you know a jazz artist, Jonathan Butler, and then Duran Duran. It's like, how do you find you in all that? So I really I had to do some soul searching and figure out who I was. And what I was was this you know kind of rocker chick that, <laughs> uh, that sings and plays saxophone and loves the blues and loves to make music that's you know, heartfelt. Yeah, I don't care yeah. if it's rocking or if it's something low key. I want to feel. So that is part of my brand. And yeah. it's been interesting to put that out there. The moment I became me and realized it and sunk into it, everything started making sense. And <laughs> it's really amazing how that works out, right? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> funny how that happens. Yeah. <laughs> but people, people say that and I, I didn't realize it until... You know, I'm just going to be me and I'm going to do what I do and they're either going to like it or not like it. And you know what? It's good that I found my place. A great level of self-confidence and you have a high level of discipline, which I'm very, very impressed with. That, that's an important quality for success in this business. Yeah. What drives you? I think making great music drives me, mm. but I think being inspired drives me. And I, I want to make music that moves me. It's that one thing in my life that is always there that I can draw from. There have been times in my life where I've made music and just thought, eh, yeah, it's just okay. Yeah. It doesn't move me. That's what drives me. Yeah. It drives me to get to that place where, okay, I just wrote that song and it was, eh. I want to write that song that just makes me explode when I'm on stage and just be, just think it's the coolest thing in the world and play it and feel like I'm taking the world on every night. <laughs> you know, that, that just immense feeling of, yeah, I love what I'm doing. I love what I'm playing. 
And I think that takes discipline to get to that place because you have to find what inspires you first of all. Yeah. And you have to work hard to be able to create it. And that's, that's what I work at. You know, if I'm not on the road, I'm in sessions writing songs with people and trying to craft something that I think is great and that I want to play every night. You know, and if I'm not there, then I'm planning the next recording or the next what this is going to, you know, what the next record's going to look like. And, you know, just trying to make it something that inspires me to grow every day and just makes me feel like, yeah, we're doing it. I can stand <laughs> on the stage every night with my band and just feel like we're taking over the world. Uh, but the, you're right. It does take discipline yeah. and an immense amount of structure to have that freedom, and I love that. Fantastic, what made you spark the idea of writing a book, How to Play Madison Square Garden? I've spent my life touring, and I've spent my life watching bands, and I've made every mistake on stage. <laughs> I've just done everything wrong, um, and I've watched people do it right. Yeah. And at a certain point, I thought to myself, why has no one written this down? <laughs> you know, I've got textbooks on how to play the saxophone and fingerings on how to play these notes cooler and, <laughs> you know, how to play piano and how to function in the music business, how to get a record deal. You know, everyone's written all these books and there are classes and there's nothing about how to perform. Yeah. And here's something that I've spent my life doing and watching and studying so I just thought, I'm gonna start writing this down. Sure enough, I mean, it took a couple years of me just kinda, you know, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna write that. Ooh, I remember that, I'm gonna add this. And it just kept growing and growing. Uh, my father was a part of it. My father helped me write the book and I just said, you know, from your perspective, you know, how does this work? And I would watch him put together bands when I was a kid, so he put in some input. and. It was a really interesting thing to write, but I, I just figured entertainment and being a great performer is something you can learn. Yeah. And it's something that can allow you to take the music that you create that's so heartfelt to the people. It's not just for you. Yeah. You actually are gonna connect with people and play your music for them and learn how to make them buy another ticket yeah. and become a great performer instead of maybe just a great songwriter, or maybe just a great player, if you can expand that part of your craft, I mean, you could go anywhere. This is how people are making a living these days. Absolutely. I mean, people aren't making tons of money selling their records. They're making tons of money on the road with their fans coming to see them. It's that palpable, people can touch you, people can look into your eyes, and you can communicate with them one-on-one. -on -one. It doesn't happen on a computer like that. So I wanted to create that, create kind of a classroom that maybe could save a couple people a few years of their life in, in <laughs> dark and dirty clubs like I did, you know, six nights a week playing and making every mistake. <laughs> well, the book for sure has great advice and wisdom in there, which I advise everyone to read for sure. The people that are watching these interviews, and they, I meet many of them globally as I travel around the world, and they're so inspired by them. What would you, in closing, what would you say to this next generation? that could give them, you know, just the, the skills or the tools or the inspiration of what they can do to follow their dream. The music business is a crazy place and we all do it because we're just crazy enough that we have to make music with our lives and I, I love that. I'm gonna go back to me in high school and I'll tell you a short story yeah. and, and I was really lucky to learn something early on um, that helped me. But when I was a senior in high school, they had this thing called a Florida All-State Jazz Band. And they they had a symphonic band and a jazz band. And if you were in the state of Florida, you could audition. And they'd choose the best people. Mm. And there would be one jazz band and there would be one symphonic band. I did not want the symphonic band. I thought the jazz band was pretty cool. I knew nothing about jazz, but it seemed that those were the cool kids. So there were two alto saxophone spots. And I was like, let's see see what I got. I started practicing and I practiced for a few weeks and, you know, I had to go to this audition. And then I thought to myself, am I insane? I'm this little chick from St. Petersburg, Florida, playing a saxophone in my room. 
there's like 50 guys in the state of Florida that are going to eat me up and spit me out. You're kidding me that I even think I have a chance at this. This is nuts. So a few days went by. My father comes in. He's like, no saxophone? What's going on? And I was like, I, I don't have a chance at this. This is, this is nuts. And he goes, oh, well, I guess you could just quit and, you know, just let it be, you know, whatever. Mm. And I was like, well, I don't want to quit. All right, fine. I'm just going to go for it. You know, so I, I went in and I did the audition. And I got it. I got first chair alto sax for the jazz band. Fantastic. And I came back to my dad and I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> I, I actually got it. This is crazy. <laughs> and he sat me down. He goes, you just learned something really, really immense. He goes, sometimes it's not the most talented people who get what they want. It's always the people who work for it. Yeah. And it's always the people who go after it. Doesn't mean they're not the most talented. Yeah. But if you go after your dreams and you try for things, you have a chance at getting them. If you sit by the sidelines and get psyched out or tell yourself you're not good enough or just, you know, oh, I, I don't think I have a chance at that, you'll never get it. So I haven't gotten everything I've gone for. I've failed it quite a lot, but I've gotten a lot, a lot, a lot more uh, because I've gone for it over the years. You tried. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic. It was amazing to hear you play at the sessions. Jam session was fantastic. You Thank wired you. everybody up. You played intense right off the start. It was right there <laughs> in their face. They were excited. You lifted them to their feet. I thank you so much, Minnie. You have done fantastic. And you shaked my bones. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good girl. Thanks. Good to be here, Dom. Thank you.